Praise God. And it's so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning and to worship God, isn't it? To give Him praise and glory. Now at this time, I'm going to invite Reverend Carlton to come up. Pastor Carlton, a man of God. And let's open our ears to hear what the Holy Spirit will speak through our brother today, because I know he has something good for each one of us. Amen. On now, I think. There we go. That was my uh, my thing is here in my pocket as opposed to on my hip. And so when I reached, I reached on the hip, but it wasn't there. <laughs> you ever had that moment where you reach for something, you know exactly where that thing is, and it's just not there. But thank God because he made sure that I had something somewhere that would work. So I thank God for our sound team, our technology team that's back there. Listen, if you can't give those folks a round of applause, you need to evaluate your situation because these lights that burn here, the, 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 the audio that you're hearing right now, if you are blessed by the, the videos that are online, they make sure that all of those things happen. And if you are so inclined, and whether you know technology or not, and you want to be a part of that, I cannot stress enough getting in touch with Josh to make sure that you can come and be a part of that ministry, because we need you. Just like everything else that goes on in church, right? It cannot be run by the same six people for 50 years. It certainly can't be run by the same six people for the next 50 years. So there are enough people in the house that can handle the workload of the house. And if each one of us put in a little bit of time, the same way that Reverend John talked about, you know, don't worry about how, whether you have hundreds of hours of free time to devote to something, but if you've got an hour to make a phone call, or you've got an a, a, a hour and a half to serve in the children's ministry, or you have 15 minutes to greet somebody as they come in the door on a Sunday morning, do it. Because God has blessed you. And when we recognize who he is, we are changed on the inside, and it makes us do things differently. It bubbles up out of us. Not because we think we're going to get some kind of blessing from God for, for doing this thing or doing that thing or serving here or, or, or serving there, but because of who God is, I can't contain a desire to help others. Because when I was lost, when I didn't know, when I wasn't in my right mind, God came through another person to grab a hold of me and remind me of who I belong to. So no matter where you find yourself, trust me, God is reaching out and grabbing a hold. Even if you work behind the scenes, you don't have to be up here preaching a message. You don't have to sing a song. You don't have to dance and shout through the sanctuary. But trust me, if you are putting your hand into the work of the church, somebody is feeling it and is being blessed and pulled closer to who God is and a reminder of what God has done. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. That's not my sermon this morning. <laughs> so let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning because you, God, take care of everything. We are often uh, caught off guard as people, but we should be grateful that, we, that you, God, are never caught off guard. You, God, are never surprised. You, God, are never taken aback by what's happening because you, God, have the view that sees, has seen the beginning because you caused the beginning to start. You have seen the progress in the middle because you have been right along through it. And, God, you have seen the end because in the end you are there. So you are never surprised. And for that we are grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I've got this. 
and I hope that I will make it work properly. <laughs> but the title of my sermon today is called This I Know. And we're going to be walking through Psalm 73. So I would have you write that down in your bulletin, in your notebook somewhere, because a homework assignment for you this week is to go through, again, all of Psalm 73. And I'm going to go through it this morning, so be aware that that's where we're going to be. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app or whatever it is that you use to partake of the Word of God, you can use that open to it because that's where we'll be. And this message was difficult for me to prepare, not because uh, the Word of God is particularly hard, but because, as I've told Pastor Sean many times, and I've let other folks know who've asked me to speak, is if you give me a large amount of time before I'm going to preach, God begins to deal with me in the area of whatever he lays on my heart to share. So Pastor Sean gave me two weeks, so that means that for the last couple of weeks, God has been dealing with me in a lot of things. This even happened coming in here on a Sunday morning. A good friend uh, said to me one morning, she said, uh, she said, Pastor Carlton, and she didn't say Pastor Carlton, but I'm not going to use the, 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 the common phrase that she tends to find herself. Actually, she's not here. So she called me by my nickname, and she told me, she said, hey, I see something's going on with you. What's wrong? And I was like, well, there's nothing wrong. I didn't think there was anything wrong. I thought I was, you know, walking in the same way that I normally would. I thought I was smiling in the same way that I normally was. But there was something that she saw that made me kind of stop and get pulled back to begin to think. And then it wasn't a week later that I stopped by my parents' house in the evening to pick up one of my kids. And my mom said to me, she said, what's wrong? And I said, there's nothing wrong. I just walked in the door. I didn't do anything. <laughs> but she also said, you know, I just see something going on, and I'm not sure what it is, but you're saying you're okay, and I'm, I'm okay, so let's just keep on going. And so as I began to uh, prepare this message, I actually rewrote several messages in, in the time that we got to this point because I was really dancing around a, 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 a an idea or dancing around what God was putting on to me as we were preparing. And the thing that God was letting me know, you're not okay. And that was hard to accept because if you ask me, I am okay. I am ready. I'm doing things. I'm working. I'm serving, I'm making phone calls, I'm getting connected to people outside at work, I'm getting connected to people outside as I wander around, and I'm walking in what God has called me to do, but on the inside, I really am not okay. And I say that because for the last year, my life has been an incredible whirlwind of stuff. Now, some are aware and some aren't of how we found ourselves here at Calvary Chapel. And that's an amazing story of God's blessing and his provision, but also a time of testing in the Lord. See, the church where we served and the church that we were a part of for many years closed its doors. And here we are, and there are some that came along with us and serve here at Calvary through that time but many of them are not here. And there are a lot of conversations that I can no longer have. And a lot of people who are near and dear to my heart that I no longer have connection to. But I desperately want it. And it eats at me because they were so very important to my life that I want to grab a hold of them, but I cannot because I will not force myself onto someone. Because the thing that I've learned from my God is that you don't do this. That's not what you do. You're there for them. You pray for them. You stand in the gap for them. But you do not drive them crazy. But on the flip side of that, that doesn't mean that you don't make a phone call and leave a message. Because I've left many a message. That doesn't mean that you don't let them know that you're praying for them, even if it's from afar.
And as I've been trying to come back to some level of equilibrium, part of the reason why I've been going so hard is because I've been trying to find my bearings, trying to find some stability on, as I walk. And I, and I know, you know, the, the, Lord, the Lord is my stability. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is the thing that I walk on that gives me that. But, man, it seems like that plank that big, long road, wide road that I walked on has gotten narrower and narrower until finally it feels like I'm on a tightrope where just a moment of weakness will knock me off and there I will fall. But the thing that I found is that God is there even in that moment. That as like a, you know, if you, you talk to people who do um, uh, lifeguards and they talk about jumping in the water to save someone who is thrashing around because they're nervous about drowning, a lot of times the lifeguard will let that person tire themselves out. And the reason why is because if the lifeguard were to grab that person while they're flailing, you could end up, both of you going down because that person will drag you down with them. And that's what God has done over the last year. God has let me tire myself out. He's let me flail. He's let me rail at the heavens. He's let me shout with triumph when he has shown himself to be faithful, but all in an effort to tire me out. And then he reached his hand down and he saved me. He saved me from here he saved me from here. He saved me from myself. And that's what gets us to Psalm 73. Because the one thing that I know is that God is consistent. God is faithful, and God has dealt with his people in a way that is consistent for all time. And so if you read Psalm 73, you see a psalmist who is in that moment. So we'll start with verse 1. All right, I pushed the button. I did, I promise. Okay. He starts the psalm in that place where it's like, I know God is good. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. God is good. That is important. You have to have that settled. If you don't, you're going to get stuck in the next few verses. But he makes a point to say in the beginning that God is good. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my f uh -oh. but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Why, Lord? Why me? Why am I going through this thing? There are people who don't work half as hard as I do, and they're doing better than me. God, I don't get it. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. <laughs> yes! I read that and I said, now that's how impossible your brain takes you. They are both fat and sleek. That means that they eat well, but they're in perfect health and perfect strength. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through their fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. All right, let's try this again. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? 
the people see the prosperity of the wicked and they turn their faces back to them. And they rail against God because they see the blessing over there and they say, how can God know? This is new. This isn't in the Bible. This was never there. God didn't address this thing. Is there knowledge in the Most High? God wasn't, uh, didn't know about quantum physics. God didn't know about transgendered people. God didn't know about all of the various things that we spin around in. But because we see them getting the accolades and we see them getting the 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 the, the praise in the in, in in the real life, right, in the public square, they're not ridiculed because they worship a sky god. Because their science tells them one thing and their science tells them something else, or their research has proven this valid. But because our research always begins and is informed and thus saith the Lord, they're the ones that get lifted up in the public square and we find ourselves being marginalized to a degree. And I say to a degree, folks, because the marginalization that we feel is not as great as we are carrying it to be. So church, on both sides of this thing, right, that's happening in our culture right now, we need to have some perspective, okay? We cannot act as if we are so oppressed that they're, they're, they're murdering us in the streets. That doesn't happen here. So perspective, church, as you go through your discourse day to day. Perspective, church, as you share with other people and you try and bring God's message to them because they hear you. And their response back, but what about me? What does God say to me, a broken sinner? When you're telling me that I'm broken, You're telling me I'm not worthy. You're telling me that I don't have standing. You're telling me that before I can even come before a holy God, I've got to be right. When God didn't tell you that, he didn't treat you that way. Let me stay. Let me stay in my message this morning. Why is their lives full of peaches and cream and mine is bread and water? Behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease, they increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. God, I have served you. God, I have stood for you. God, I have shared your word. I have shared your message. But my mornings are filled with rebuke. My nights I'm stricken. But here's the turning point. Here's the turning point. It's as if God spoke to him, and I say that for me. It's as if God spoke to him the same way that God dealt with me, began to return me to myself like the prodigal son who was deep in the filth and all of a sudden came back to himself. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a worrisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. I came into the house of God. I came into the place of worship. I found myself on my knees in prayer. And there you gave me perspective. There you showed me what you are doing. There you began to deal with me in my own pain. That's the turning point. 
that's where you find the reminder. It's okay to have those painful moments. It's okay to share and, and, and talk to God and talk to the people who are close to you, that inner circle of folks. It's okay to say, I'm frustrated. It's okay to say, I'm in pain. It's okay to say, I'm hurt. And if you find yourself on the receiving end of somebody telling you about their pain, you accept their pain. Don't try and correct their pain. Don't try and fix their pain. You accept their pain. Because we have to walk through that. We have to come through the fire of the Holy Spirit working on us on the inside. We have to go through the pressure to be able to accept that though I am pressed on every side, I'm not crushed. Though I am persecuted at every angle, I'm not abandoned. You've got to be able to walk through that. If you take it away, they come away weaker. But you listen. You hear them. You embrace them. You love them. And you pray. You pray for them in their pain. You pray for them in their concern. If there's a way for you to help, sure, do something. But don't make it about you. Make it about them. And the perspective came and the perspective showed him of where people are. The ones who are on the outside and the ones who are on the inside. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. That blessing that you think they're getting on the outside, that's a slippery place. It takes away your focus. It takes away your ability to to, to, to serve. It takes away your ability to be comfortable in your own space because as it grows and as more things come, you start to worry about keeping it and it begins to eat at you. They find themselves in a slippery place. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Swept away by concerns, swept away by worries, consumed by more and more and this and that. In a culture that says that if you bought the iPhone 6 last year, just wait until Tuesday because the iPhone 6S is coming. Amen. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. And this is the one here. This is my, I call this my revelation thing right here is this. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. God is not asleep, okay? I just want to make sure everybody is aware of that. But there will come a moment where the God whom they say doesn't exist will actually exist for them, okay? The way God exists for us now, for those of us who believe, the way that we come in here and shout and praise and worship, the way that we feel his presence so very powerfully on the inside, there will come a day when God will be as real for them as he is for us. Actually, he'll be more real for everyone. And at that point, it will be too late. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was a beast towards you. This is what we do. We forget about God. We forget about who he is. We forget about what he has done. And we hate him. We become bitter in our own mess and we shake our fists at the heavens and we say, God, you're no good and God, why can't you provide for me? You're not enough. Imagine if you talk to your spouse, married people. Imagine if you talk to your parents, children. Imagine if you talk to your friends, everyone else. And you said to them, you're not enough for me because you didn't do this. I don't want you because this arbitrary thing you didn't do. 
whatever it is, because everybody's got something. They would call you a beast. They would say you were terrible. If you were a husband, you would be run out. If you were a wife, you would be chastised. If you were a child, your parents might beat you. If they were just your friend, they'll never talk to you again. Because you were brutish and ignorant and terrible and mean and awful. They wouldn't want anything to do with you. The world says those people who hurt you, push them aside. Let them go. They're no longer worthy. They don't need to be around you because all they do is bring negativity and and distress and pain into your life. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. God has not tossed you aside, even as you have cursed him, even as you have walked away from him, even as you have hated him, God has not left you. And that is what we share. And that is what changes our speech. And that is what makes us able to handle persecution. That is what makes us able to recognize the reality of God. Because he holds you in his right hand. He is keeping you close to him. It says that you cannot wrest yourself from his grasp. He is able to keep you. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Note the difference when you recognize what God has done. Who have I in heaven but you and nothing on earth that I desire besides you? I need God. We need God. We need God. We cannot do it on our own. You can't love your spouse the way your spouse needs to be loved without God. You can't love your children the way you need to love your children without God. You cannot love the world the way that the world needs love without God. You might be able to fake it for some time. You might be able to come up with some clever strategies to keep you going in the, in the short term. But in the long term moments, in those weak places, without God, what is really on the inside of you will come out. Oh, so you've got to let God change you by recognizing him. My flesh and my heart may fail, and it will but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That means that he is everything. In lack and in much, in sickness and in health, beyond death, God is your portion forever. You can't lose him. And you can't lose him because you're so great. You can't lose him because he's God. And he does not lie. So if his word tells you that you're his, and you know that you're his, and he has grabbed you because you're his, he is for you for all time. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish and you put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Even here, in this moment, the call is to tell you that you need to go and do something. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. Go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I will be with you until the end of the age. God told you that all authority I have, he has. 
and he has given it to you to go and do that thing. So you can tell of his works. You can tell of what he has done. And when you are rebuked and when you are ignored and when you are marginalized and when you are thrown aside and when you are laughed at and when you are embraced and when people receive and when they love you, you still remember that it's not you, it's God. Because church, the, un, the, un, the, the unbelievable thing for us, especially as American Christians, is that the same harvest is ripe here as it is ripe elsewhere. The challenges may be different. The situations that someone in a foreign land might feel, or you know, I, I'll speak specifically about Peru this morning, the challenges that, that, that Pastor Jose, who we went on the missions field with, the challenges that he has are very different than the ones we face here. His challenge is not about you know, how do we grow the fellowship and how do we get more people in or do we have a, 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 you know, a, a fantastic video ministry or you know, how are the children being dealt with. Like, we don't have to worry about any of that. Right? He does, he, that's not a concern for him. Okay? His concern is, will my roof fall in today? His concern is, I need to have somebody come out and clean all the trash from in front of my church building before Sunday. Or his concern is, will I have enough gas to drive from Pisco to the next town so I can train the pastor there so he can give a sermon on Sunday? Right? Those are the concerns that he has. Right? So he has to deal with a whole different set of challenges for how does he share the gospel in that situation. But you know what? He shares the gospel anyway. So for us who sit in air-conditioned buildings, I know I'm sweating right now, but for those of us who sit in air-conditioned buildings, for those of us who have soft chairs, for those of us who have hundreds of people that come around us and actually talk to us on a day-to-day -day basis, we should share the gospel anyway. It might make you uncomfortable. Yes, for my federal uh, folks, my friends that, that work on the inside, I get it. You, you got to watch what you say. But that doesn't change anything. You've got to share the gospel anyway. Because for you and for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my, I have made the Lord God my refuge. My refuge. Because remember, I don't point my fingers out. I keep them in. Right? Because this, this, these moments where I share the gospel with you and when I share the message with you is because God has dealt with me and said, share this with my people. Right? So I've got to make God my refuge every day. I've got to make sure that I'm not trying to solve my problems on my own. I've got to make sure that it's not, you know, thus saith Carlton in my house. I've got to make sure that it's thus saith the Lord. Because if it's all about Carlton, let me tell you something right now. Carlton is a crummy God. Okay? Amen, right? Carlton is a crummy God. He cannot be served enough. He can't. But I'm not God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Your God is enough. In your situation, where you, where you find yourself right now, your God is enough. Your God is enough for you to apologize. Your God is enough for you to forgive. Your God is enough to share the gospel. Your God is enough to come out of your pocket with $10 for somebody you just met. Your God is enough for the lack in your bank account and your God is enough for you to come off of the money in your bank account to give. Your God is enough for all of the situations where you find yourself. And praise God if you're moving in that direction. And praise God if you haven't. Because if you have been, then that means that more people are able to go forward. And if you haven't been, that means that you can praise God and change and be different. But you're not changing for change's sake. You're changing because your God is your portion forever. 
You're changing because your God has saved you. And even though you shook your fists at him, even as you're shaking your fists, he's holding your hand. Your God is your portion forever. And I know I just lost my microphone. And I have no idea where it went. Okay, you don't want it? Oh, you got it. Okay. Yeah. See, this is what I'm talking about. This is family, right? Microphone blows off and somebody runs up and gives it to you. Amen. So here's what I want to do, church. I want to pray. And I'm going to ask the ministers to come up as well. Because I don't know where you might find yourself right now. You might have been running and, and, and been seeing God move in amazing ways. Praise God. You might be struggling with the thing that God has given you. Praise God. But these folks are here to pray for you. These folks are here to lay hands on you. These folks are here to love you. So if you've got a praise report, I want you to come up and tell it. And we want to shout unto God for you and for what God has done in your life. If you need prayer, then I praise God, come forward and let us pray for you. Don't sit back in your comfortable chair and let the softness keep you. Because God has done amazing things. The Lord is my portion forever. I want to go back to this. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. So, Father, we pray, desiring you, seeking your face, wanting to embrace you. God, we might even be recognizing that we've been shaking our hands at you, that we've been trying to ignore you, that we may have even cursed you. But God, you have been faithful. You have been gracious. You have been our portion. Lord, there is none like you. Lord, we bless your name today. We seek your face. And I would never let a moment be lost without giving folks an opportunity to embrace you as the Lord of their life. So if you're under the sound of my voice this morning, if you are hearing from God, not Carlton, if you're hearing from God and he is beginning to pull on your heart and you are beginning to recognize yourself as a sinner, but you realize that you need God. You realize this morning that your life is different because of him. You realize at this moment that he has changed you on the inside. You realize that if he hasn't changed you, you want to be changed. Raise your hand this morning. Because God has saved you. Because you would not feel that pull. You would not feel that change. You would not feel that difference if God was not reaching down and grabbing you with his hand. And like we said this morning, if he has grabbed you, you cannot wrestle yourself from it. So you can pray with me this morning and say, God, forgive me. Save me. I want to be yours. God, we love you. 
And the ministers stand and we are ready to receive your children as they come for prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So this time is ministry time. This time is prayer time. You may be so inclined to come forward and be prayed for. These ministers are here to receive you and to receive your prayers, to hear your praise reports. They're here to love you and let you know that they are here for you. If being prayed for this morning is not being drawn out of you, that's fine. But I would ask that you would pray in your seat, that you would take a moment to just pray and ask God to bless and to save and to take care of the needs in your church. I ask that you would pray for your pastor who is away. And I would ask that you would pray for your other pastor who is still on the missions field. I ask that you would be there for the family. Husbands, pray for your wives. Wives, pray for your husbands. Children, pray for your parents. Friends, embrace one another and pray. If you see someone you've never met before, go and let them know that God has loved them and has blessed them. There is not a single reason to not be praying right now. Because God has been so very good.